Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Mike Kanakis, and on behalf of my co-lead, Phil Bosser, we'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. We are going to be talking with our guest, Stephen Judd, about what is the right, right command to use to write to the right output, aka we're going to be talking about the right command. Lets. So we'd like to welcome in our guest, Stephen, tonight. Hey, Stephen, how are you? I'm doing great. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Stephen and I have talked about this topic in the past, and I had said to Stephen that I would love to find someone who's well-versed in the right commandments because I felt like I never really knew them as well as I should. And I have worked with Stephen privately and with groups before, and Stephen has always done a really great job at explaining these topics. And Stephen thought, hey, man, why don't you give me a shot? This is kind of in my wheelhouse. I'd love to talk about that. So that's kind of how we got started with this. But for those who don't know, Stephen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your day job is like and uh, your background with PowerShell? Okay, so my my day job is I'm a digital security analyst for an oil and gas company, and I've been using PowerShell. I figured out that my first training class was officially a Microsoft training class on PowerShell in 2008. Didn't understand it at the time. Kind of made a commitment to get started and learning it in 2010. And I've been in it pretty much ever since then. Uh, I think the the breaking over point for me was I was the lead SharePoint admin at the time, and I saw that we had about this many commands that you could do in the GUI for SharePoint 2010, and they had this many, if you can see that on screen, commands that you could access via PowerShell. And I said, well, writing's on the wall, better learn this stuff. And I'm so glad I did because it's really done a lot for me in my career and my ability to get things done. And I know from speaking with you previously that you have been a mentor to people at work and you also have done training sessions to help people kind of get up to speed on PowerShell, right? That is correct. Yep. So with that being said, how many times would you say you've been through talking about these things and saw that people don't really understand all the things that there are about the right commandlets, out input, I mean, output streams, and how to use them effectively. Is this a topic that a lot of people botch? I wouldn't say that they botch it, but I think that they have strong opinions about it. And I'm actually going to cover that in my talk. So uh, I feel like we can we can jump right in unless you have more questions. No, I think that's good. Um, okay. So, so everybody, I'm, I hope you enjoy this one tonight. We're going to turn it over to Stephen, and Steve, it's all yours. All right. Well, I realized uh, I missed a great opportunity when you asked me how I was doing. I should have said, I'm all right. So what we're going to talk about is the right, 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 right. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I realized I screwed up, too. Can everyone see my screen? Don't you always have to ask that on a Teams meeting? Right. Correct. OK, let's get after this. Thanks, Kevin. So here's my little intro slide. I'm Stephen Judd. I'm a multi-year, multi-discipline IT pro. I am also a PowerShell enthusiast. I'm also a dad joke enthusiast. If you haven't figured that out yet, you'll probably figure it out. Sometimes fashion icon, maybe not. So, all right, let's get serious about the right commands. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about. What are streams? Console-based streams, very exciting. Redirection, PowerShell-based streams. By the way, there's not going to be a quiz, so you don't have to memorize all this. A call to action, some preferences because everybody has preferences. And finally, we'll finish off with some points to ponder. So let's start off first with streams definition. Here's a good definition. Interconnected input and output communication channels between a program and its environment. Wow, doesn't that sound great? And I stole it, of course, because I didn't have a good definition from it. So that was from standard streams. OK, great. Let's start talking about console streams. All right, so we have standard streams. What is a console stream? If you have your standard console, which is command processor, command.com, if you're old school and going with the DOS, CMD, EXE, Windows, et cetera, 
or even the Linux host where you're dealing with Bash or Corn Shell or whatever your preferred terminal is, you have standard input, sometimes abbreviated STDIN, standard in. And you got standard output, okay? You put stuff in, you get stuff out, cool. And then if you screwed up, you get the third piece of this uh, stream is you get the standard error. So some, if you look in the documentation, you'll see STDERR. And this not very great image, I didn't have time to redraw it, I really should have, but you can kind of get the ideas. You In the gray square, you have the text terminal and you got your keyboard and as you're typing, it's going standard in. And then when you hit enter, your process. So in this case, let's say, um, when um, we're doing directory in, in DOS or in the command window. So you type in, DIR and you press enter and the process, the command processor will do that. And then the standard out will be the files that you see. Or if you do DIR or excuse me, DEL on the Windows directory, we would hope that it wouldn't allow you to do that. Or you do something on NT loader, you get an error and that's going to show up in standard error. Okay, console streams is it's sort of cool, but you kind of get the gist of what that's about. Uh, redirection is when you send one stream to another stream, or what you call it when you tell a stream where to go twice, right? Because it's redirection something. Okay, it's a joke. You only have to tell a stream where to go one time. And it looks like this. I'm gonna send number two to number one, and that's gonna redirect the error stream into the success stream. Well, why would you wanna do that? Typically, you see this when you want to capture the output to a log and you wish to send the success and the failure messages into one file. If you don't do that, what will go into the file will be what's in the success stream. Okay. I have never used redirection. Eh, okay, maybe rarely. I don't, don't, don't want to do any hard lines here, but only on other people's code because I follow the proper use of the streams in my code rendering redirection unnecessary. And that's what's so awesome. And of course, with anything you make a strong statement, there's always exceptions. If you want more details about the streams, you can follow this link. And uh, yes, this does remind me, this is the new thing with uh, Edge. When you copy a URL and you paste it, you get the, you get the title text instead of the actual URL. Uh, so uh, I will make this slide available so you can just click it. But if you search about redirection PowerShell in the Microsoft Docs, you'll get that. Ooh. Hey, I got I got questions. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to that slide for a sec. Redirection. Yeah, going back. So this this two and one redirect error to the success. Mm -hmm. So um, I've always heard about this and I've never done it either. And I understand that if you kind of know what you're doing with PowerShell that you shouldn't have to do that. But it seems to me like, is that like an old programming trick from other languages that people yes. are carrying forward and trying to do in PowerShell? Yes, it is. All right. Yes, so that's it's really exactly a, right. So this is a, a habit that we really need to unlearn. Mm, yes. Now, again, I'm going to point out the exceptions exist bullet. But yes, this is a habit that I think PowerShell people should unlearn. The reason that the redirect is so important is because in in the Linux world, especially, everything is text and you have to process everything as text. Well, we're in PowerShell. We don't deal with the text anymore. We deal with objects. And so there's things you can do in there that are just not available if you're text based only. And so the, the redirects, there's there's ways to do it. And I've got some examples, so we'll see that. Uh, so any other questions? So you, before you go nuts, Glenn Sardi is, is basically jumping up and down like a madman in chat because he thinks we're crazy. So if you would mind explaining, Glenn, I would love to know. Well, if I think to, to Glenn's point, really the thing is that not everything is inside PowerShell, so that only works, you know. So if you do anything outside, use batch, use command line, or if you're using Linux and you're using other things, that all applies. So you should, you know, it, it, the same applies, but like with everything else, uh, the stream processing and how streams work are all the, effectively the same. But that's the context to greater than, you know, at one, 
is one of those things to redirect from one stream to another. Now the noting that there's, you know, stream is on two, this is on one, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of, hey, you just need to learn the language. That's really what it is. But the idea, the fundamentals of understanding that there are streams and streams go in different places and they, they effectively are different channels, that is a fundamental thing that you should definitely understand. Now, how you do it and is just, you gotta be familiar with the language. So, so, so that's the reason that I wanted to do this discussion because I feel like I have knowledge gaps and I wanna fill in the thing. So when you see, you know, two and one, I've seen that and I've never had to use it and I don't know why. So I'm just trying to clarify that for myself and probably other people that are watching. I can give you a, a really easy example if you want. Sure. Has anybody ever done Java dash dash version to figure out what version of Java you're on? Yeah. Yeah. That writes up to standard error, not standard out. So if you want to log that in a CI system, you have to redirect it to standard out to even see it. What Interesting. I think Git has that same problem as well, right? Git yeah. binary. Yeah. Because standard error is not a structured output. It's just a bucket that it isn't standard out or standard in. Unfortunately, I've come across that so many times with external tools. So ultimately, like Glenn said, it's an external tool thing. And so it's just using that, that tool and where it is. And so because that application doesn't write to the right place, or what we what I believe, and granted what I believe, whatever. But if it doesn't do it into that stream, you need to grab it. Or you're trying to do something, oh hey, I see it on the console, but I don't see it here. It's probably exactly like Glenn said, it's just in the wrong stream or the other streams. Now again, but, a lot of what we're discussing here is not specifically PowerShell, but it's definitely something to know about streams. And you know, just because you see text on screen doesn't necessarily mean that what you think is happening is what's happening. So it's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on. All right. So PowerShell is greater than Command EXE. Okay. It has more streams than the standard console. Now. Glenn just pointed out something I didn't know is that POSIX has more streams than those as well. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. But PowerShell has six streams to be exact. And so what we're going to be talking about is the right commandlets from the Microsoft PowerShell utility module to send data's, data into those streams. Okay. And so that's how we're going to control whatever output you want to have into the various streams. So it's time to jump into the streams with both feet. Of course, I like jokes that really make a splash. Isn't that right, Mike? I'm staying on mute. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so stream number one. Let's talk about the first and the most important stream, in my opinion, the success stream. It's also known as the output stream or the success pipeline. It's what's displayed in the console by default keyword being by default, and it comes from out host. Uh, hold up now, out host is not a write command. I know we were talking about write command, it's, but out host is automatically appended to every PowerShell command. That's interesting, okay. If you go look at the out host command, it only has one parameter available to it, paging. Thus, you can use pipe out host dash paging to get more. And paging basically functions like more. It scrolls up and when it hits the bottom, it'll pause until you hit spacebar or enter. Okay. However, I find it faster to type pipe to more, plus I'm more familiar with more. Okay. Uh, did you say you wanted more? All right. You want some more more? I'll give you some more more. More in Windows PowerShell is actually a function with a single parameter. Well, that's interesting, how did you figure that out? Well, I ran, pardon me for the abbreviations, but when, I, when I'm at the console, I abbreviate like a maniac. I do git command more, and I pipe that into select exp script box. You know what, let's do it. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so here I am, Windows PowerShell, git command more, Let's just run that first. And as you can see, it's a function. All right, well, let's go see what's in that function. So select, I'll tab to that so we get it, expand property. And I want the script block. 
interesting. So that's what it looks like. And so this is where it's taking a string parameter and the string is paths. Okay, before I get into that, I want to go back to my slides because my slides explain this. At least I think they do. So more calls more.com to return more unless you pass pass, and then more will get the content of the pass to pass to more.com, resulting in more content for more.com to more again, or some might say to moron. Oh my God. <laughs> God. I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Apologizing I, now. I think I'm going to need to put a disclaimer on the start of this video for the people <laughs> who watch. You knew what you were getting into when you agreed <laughs> to let me talk. Oh, oh and I, oh. but more in PowerShell is actually more.com. All right, so remember get command here on more. Let's do that over in PowerShell 7. Get command more. And it's just the application. Okay, but that's that's what out host is doing is out host is coming in and out host has paging. That's all it has. Actually, let's, let's jump over here and look at that. We'll just do text. Mess up some text and I'll pipe that to out host. And I'll hit that. And you can see paging plus the other standard ver um, parameters. That's it. That's what it does. Not very exciting. But that's what's happening when you're uh, when you're sending content to the success stream. And that's how it gets there. Let's see, I already did that command, so we're off. All right, so let's talk about write output. Because write output is how data gets to the success string. So write output sends the specified objects to the next command in the pipeline. Okay, so whatever you send into write output, it sends it down. If there isn't a pipeline, it sends it to out default, which is added to the end of every pipeline. Okay, but I already said that out host is automatically added. So what is out default doing? Yeah, out default actually comes before out host to evaluate whether there's a registered view for the object type being passed. So according to the help, not according to me, the view specifies which properties to display and how they should be displayed. Okay, so you send something down the pipeline, you hit its right output, Right output sends it to out default. Out default sends it, checks it, evaluates, and sends it on to out host. Okay, since out host is added by out default automatically, right output passes the objects across the non specified pipeline to out default. Okay, I think I just said that, so I don't, I don't need to say that again. I know it's a little confusing, but that's what is happening behind the scenes when you're running right output. Of course, I had to get this from some information for some. Uh, from some documentation so that I actually got it right. There's the link, how PowerShell formatting and outputting really works. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you don't use right output. I have a major head explode. If I have a major head explode from the dad jokes, I'm going to try to do it by confusing you, but then I'm going to make sense out of it. Now, seriously, don't use right output. And you may be saying to yourself, okay, I use right output all the time. Why? It's slow. Okay. All it does, all write output does, is wrap the commandlet write object, which is already called by default when outputting to the success stream. So success stream has the write object in front of it all the time. So now you have write output going to pipeline. If there is no pipeline, it sends it to out default. Out default goes to out host. Out host goes to write object because write object is in front of the success stream. Now, of course, all this happens in the background. It's all, all kind of programmatic magic, so you don't have to do anything about it. But why do we care that it's slow? Well, it's because Mark Krauss knows better than we do, so we should not use write output because Mark Krauss says that. And here's his blog, Let's Kill Write Output. So if you really want to go digging into the details of why write, uh, write output is bad, he actually gives some examples that shows it's slower. So what do you do? You just send your command into the success stream by not putting any more data in there. And when it hits the console or it hits the command processor, it will go straight to out default, straight to out host, straight to the success stream, straight to however it's supposed to be displayed. Now I know that's a lot, so I'm gonna pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions about what I just said. So let's cover that again. So not using write output, what would I be doing instead? 
you just send your command directly to the console. Or in your script, you just put it on the, the command. And when it crosses it, so like this, um, if I do ls and I hit enter, I get that. If I say ls and I do write output, I get the exact same thing. The second one, imperceptibly, is slower than the first one because it has to process the right output, then it processes out default and out host and then displays. So it, it's adding an extra command. Now you'll never notice this in probably, in if you're in interactive use, you'll never notice that. It's way too fast. But if you're going through a loop and you're doing a lot of commands, it starts to show up. But what about if I'm writing scripts and I just want to return informational messages to people on the screen that have uh -huh. nothing to do with the command. So just status updates, let's say. Okay. That is something else we're going to get to. So please okay. hold that thought. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. I use right now, put this into a log file. This, this you're talking about the console. What if you send it to a file? So if you're doing write output, how are you sending it to the file? Okay, I'm I'm mixing up something. I'm mixing up with something in my head. That's that's right. I think okay. you're probably thinking of write information. Or add content or probably thinking out file. Out mm. out file. So I, yeah, so they're using write host, I use out write output and I send that to out file. Uh, okay. Thank you. So whatever it is, whatever command you're using to gather your information, you can skip the write output part and just type it right into out file. So, I mean, as you can see here, this is, it takes input objects and it shoves them down the pipeline. That's really about it. Now, I see a no enumerate in there, and frankly, I didn't look into that. I don't know what that does. So I'd have to look into that. Okay. Okay. All right. Yep. Back, to, back to where we're at. All right. So that's the success stream. That's the long and the hard one. And it's confusing because when you look at it, you're trying to figure out what all that business is about. But it's just, it's pipe, uh, it streams, to, blah. Let's see if I can get my language to work now. It is stream one, and it's where everything is successful. This is where you want to put your objects. So, whatever functions you're writing or scripts you're writing, you want your successful objects to go into stream one, success stream. Okay. That's going to be important because we're going to come back to where the other ones go. Specifically, but you say that you say that like I need to do that, but that is really what happens by default. Correct. Correct. I'm I'm going to cover that a little bit more. So just hang with me for a little bit. Sure. Uh, the error stream. So let's talk about the error stream. I'm going to change streams a little bit here, and thank goodness the error stream is not confusing and is easy. Right. Okay. Errors that occur in the console will go to the error stream and be stored in the error variable in reverse order okay so uh, let me talk about reverse order right quick is the most recent error that you have is error array position zero because it's a zero based array and then the one that happened just before that is error one so the dollar error variable is an automatic variable that is grabbing up all of the errors you can use this to your advantage in your scripts or in the console so you can go see what errors you've had. And the most recent one is always gonna be dollar error, square braces, zero, okay? How do these errors get in there? Okay, um, quick side note, I really kind of wish I'd taken this off the slide, but I didn't. Uh, I've heard people say when you get a bunch of errors, it looks as the console's bleeding because of all the red. But anyway, so console bleeding, how do you get, errors into the error stream. Well, we were gonna use write error, okay? So write error will send a non-terminating error to the error stream and will also store the error in the error variable. Good. If you wanna end after write error, so you're writing a function and you, if you get an error, you want it to stop. Write error will not stop the code because it's a non-terminating error. You need to code the stopping. So what I like to do is I like to catch any errors 
in a try catch block and then either use write error or uh, followed by return or use throw to write the error and then end processing. Frankly, I wind up using throw more because I know it's a, um, well, I'm about to explain why it is. So the difference between write error and throw is write error is non-terminating, which means script keeps going, which is good if you want to say, hey, this didn't work, but it's not going to break my script, so keep rolling. Throw is terminating, which means if this error happens, we're done, we're out, just stop it, stop everything, because you can't continue. So for example, if you're trying to um, write a file to a network location and you test to see if that network location is there and it's not there, well then nothing else in your script is gonna work. However, you've seen the non-terminating errors whenever you've done uh, like a recursive look through a directory and there may be a directory or a file that you can't read. Well, you don't want your recursive um, search of files to stop. You just say, here's an error, couldn't get there. Or if you're trying to uh, run a script against a number of servers that you've pulled back and you're using invoke command and you're saying, here's a hundred servers, go run this command against them. But one of those servers may be offline so you can't reach it for whatever reason. You don't want that to be a terminating error. You want it to get all the ones. You want to see the error that the one that didn't work and then keep going on the rest of them. Okay, that's the difference between write error and, and throw. But both of them send their output to the error stream and to the error variable. Okay, demo. Please tell me that played. That played. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that played. <laughs> All Good right, Batman. <laughs> we okay. Let's go look at the code because it'll make more sense. Oh look, I have a demo for write output that I forgot. Let's go look at that. I told you not to use write output. There's your demo. Okay, back to writer. All right, let's look at this function right quick. I'm loading my demo error. I'm going to do get item of one, and one doesn't exist. Neither does two, neither does three, whatever. Okay, so each one of these is going to do get item, and we're going to see what it does. So the first one is just going to run, then it's going to do a try catch block. Actually, I probably should put a little space in here so you can see the difference between number or test number one, test number two, da da da. Okay, and then this one's part of that. All right, so when I run this thing, it's going to load up my function. It's going to hit wait debugger because I wanted to make sure this thing paused so I can step through it. And then we go to demo error. Here we go. Okay, wait debugger. I'm going to F11 my way through this thing. All right, so I'm on error. Here comes the first one. Where's my error? There it is. I forgot to scroll down in my console. All right, so it says, okay, here's an error. Get item didn't work. You have an error on line number two. Cannot find the path. Okay, so now if I go right here and I type dollar error, I'm gonna put zero in here. That is exactly the error I just got. Exactly the same. Okay, what if I've got more errors in there? Do I have other errors? Yep, I've got other errors because I've run this a little bit, so I've got errors in my console. Okay, let's press F11 or, and keep rolling. So we're gonna do a try block on get item number two. Okay, there it goes. It did not go to catch. Why did it not go to catch on get item two? Well, I explained just a minute ago, if you're doing get child item or get item, those generate non-terminating errors. So if you have a non-terminating error in a try block, it's not gonna to go to catch. It did throw the error. So we saw the error because it said line five, here's my error. And if I go into my error now, my error variable, actually I'm gonna just up arrow because it's faster. Yeah, there it is. It's still my line five error because that was my latest error. Now my error number one is my line two error. You see how this is working? Okay, so let's look at line number 12 now. I'm gonna do get item three but this time I'm gonna send it error action stop. Okay, so I'll press F11 on there. Now it goes to the catch. 
because I specified my error action to stop instead of continue. Okay, the default action for get item is to continue. I'm now telling it, if you run into an error, stop. And so my tried block now sends it to my catch block. So now I get right error, item three not found. Okay, so now I'm controlling the message that's going to my users. Now notice, by doing right error, code is still going. Okay, so now we're going to see the difference between that and throw. Here's get item three, error action stop, goes into the catch. When I hit F11 this time, I get my error, and we're done. Did not make it to the right post command. Okay, good time to pause. Ask if there's any questions about this. That's very interesting. So with a try catch, you assume the code's looking, you're saying that it's some commands like get item will not uh, ever go to catch. What other things? How do we figure out which commandlets will go will uh, go to the error stream and, and not terminate and not uh, go to catch? Yeah, so good question. I don't know the answer to that because when you run get help on commandlets, unless they put in there, by the way, if this commandlet has an error, it's going to be a non-terminating error, which I've never seen this before. You, you just don't know. So you have to run test. What I do is I put error action stop on every command for the most part where I want to make sure a try block moves to the catch block. Now there's something else we're going to talk about to how to do this, but that's one way to do it. Because I always try to do, you know, create the failure scenario to make sure the failures work. So I would have caught that, but I wasn't even thinking about it. And I'm sure yeah. that it's probably something other people may not think about a test out. So in cool. those cases, most of the time, you know, the error action is silently continue. That is across the board. Now, granted, anybody can write whatever they want as their default option, but 90% of the time, it's typically silently continue. And as he said right there in line 12, if you're actually looking and you're trying to create this with a try catch, the probably the best practice is to do what he did there is to say, hey, error action, I want you to stop. That way, it's not going to just automatically continue. It's not going to silently continue because there are different error actions. So continue is there. So it will, it will like tell you that it happened, but it will keep on going. Or you can say silently continue. Don't even tell me it happened and just keep on going. So when you're, when you're working with that and you're trying to troubleshoot that, it's best to actually use the error action option and then do that, but do that only where you need to. Yep, I, I wanna throw a little bit in on that. The default is actually continue, not silently continue, because if it's silently continue, you wouldn't see the error message. And there are times for that when, like if you're doing a, an if test and you wanna see whether something is there and if it's not there, you want particular code to run, I like to use error action silently continue because it'll still fail and move into the code area I want it to, but we won't see red text on screen because I'm expecting the code to handle that at that time. And I don't want my users to be worried that they got an error and they don't know why they got an error. Because it and also that error goes into the error stream. Just to be uh, clear. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, let's move on. We got we got one stream or two streams down. We got some more to do. So let's talk about the best practices for the error stream right quick, and then we'll get on to the next stream. So errors are for displaying something that has failed. That's important. The reason I say this, and this is where we're talking about, you know, I'm getting opinionated in that we have errors for reasons, and we have how these things get handled for a reason. Don't play around with that. If you're having an error, send it to the error stream. Do not set dollar error to null and clear out all the errors at the top of your script. Okay, that's abusive to your users to remove the errors that they may have needed without letting them know that you're doing that. When I see this in scripts and I see this in functions, I get um, a little girth face on that because I'm like, no, don't do that. Just know that the errors that you're trying to deal with are at the top. So the last in first out principle does matter and you need to be watching for that, okay? So, so handle it that way. Another point, do not change the error action preference. 
So the error action preference by default is continue. Don't get in there and mess around with that. Don't change it to stop. Now you could change it to stop, but I'm suggesting that you don't do that. And I say, come at me, bro. Okay. Use error action stop to generate the terminating errors instead. Now, nothing, nothing is a hard, fast rule on this. Okay. I will grant that if you're writing a function, setting error action preference to stop only changes the function scope and not the script scope or the console scope. Okay. So it's somewhat safe because it'll just change that inside your function. The good news about that is now you don't have to do error action stop on a really long script where you've got a lot of commands. So that's a that's a good idea. But I'm just I'm telling you this that you need to be careful and pay attention to where your scopes are. I, I think you're gonna sorry, go I ahead think, Mike. I was gonna say I think you're gonna need to pause here. I think there's a few people that have some things they want to talk to you about. Okay. There are some commandlets out there, particularly AD, that don't understand the concept of silently continue. And the only way around that is to use error action preference and, and set it within the scope of where you're running that to, to, to have it not throw error messages out on screen. That and exchange commandlets I as well. I have not seen that where I've done the error action onto it. So you're saying okay. that when you do the dash error action, they don't honor that? Uh, the silently continue definitely. I'm not yeah. sure about the other ones, and I think someone was talking about Exchange being bad on that yeah. also. Yeah, Exchange and older versions. Um, I remember 2010 and 2013 commandlets had that same problem, but Exchange and AD were very much not honoring that, where you had to do the error preference equals stop. So, huh? Okay. But now it's just Exchange Online, so it's a little bit different. But AD is a very common one, so. I haven't seen that. I have seen some odd behavior based on, well, first of all, the AD commandlets are very odd in their behaviors anyway, so I'm not going to put it past them. Um, the The point is well taken that uh, you need to test and you need to see how it works. I'm just telling you what I consider to be the best practice. And so again, Stephen's presentation, Stephen's slides, Stephen's opinion. <laughs> so to that point is, yes, best practices overall, yes, it should be fit that way. But there are edge cases, and like everything in the world, it all depends. And so, you know, AD is one of those quirky things, but there are things that are just quirky about AD itself. And I know that some of those things are on the list of things to fix in AD, but because they wrap a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of funky stuff, they, they were one of the first, and, you know, because it's core, they, they're, it's going to be slow to change, too. It's important to bring up, though, because just like Robert said, it's, it's, it's one that a lot of the new guys jump into, right, AD and PowerShell, and something that I, I definitely want to call out. So, okay. yes, I do right. agree for the best part, Steve. So, if you're going to do that, I'm going to I'm going to say it again. Do it in a function, okay? So, put your error action preference in a function, or if you absolutely must do it in a script, gather the error action preference first and put it into a variable. So, you know, do error action preference into my your uh, start preference, right? And then capture it, and then at the end of your script set it back it but then watch out for if you've got try catch and throws in the middle because your throw is going to happen and it's not going to set the error action preference back and i'm now, just cautioning you about being abusive to your users don't do that now steven if you throw throw that into a finally block that should still run even though you put in the throw does right. it yes i yeah. thought throw tossed you out immediately it still a, runs its finally block. It does? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good so to know. It finally Next. runs most so, of the time. Like if you reboot the machine in, th in, in the catch area, the finally isn't going to catch it. Oh my God, I made some, I made a dad joke. Um, but continue so, on. So hold on. I, higher right. scope. So whatever scope you're in, depending on how far you are, it will jump back up this, you know, it's a big stack. And so that's the, how it's working. So, you, you know, it's kind of a CS thing computer science kind of thing as far as stacks and queues, but it's a stack. So it's going to throw to the next higher stack and whoever that might be. We're going to do this right now live. How about that? Well, all right. Let's try it. It did not write host. I stay corrected. Yeah. I didn't know the answer to that. I've always thought that throw 
is effectively the same thing as uh, write error and return, which means it throws you completely out. So it doesn't make it to the finally because throw is a terminating error and terminating oh. errors is I'm done. Interesting. Because it, depending upon where you read and so on, finally is supposed to actually interrupt that and do something before going into catch. It's, I need to play around with it. So, yeah, because it's terminating. And so it goes up to the higher stack, which is go up. And so, yeah, it never gets the final. So here's the other one I was talking about, and not in my demo, but we're making it now, is you do the right error, and then you do a return. I would, I would expect this to do the same thing, so I'm going to F8 that. And that did something completely different. Look at that. So throws behavior and uh, doing a return off of a right error work on different paths. Yep. Interesting. All right, so, everyone's got food for thought now. Well, hold on. So I don't know if he still wants to ask it, but Rick has been waiting to ask a question. Okay. He pulled his hand down. So Rick Babbitt, I don't know, Rick, if you still had a question or if someone answered it. I'm on. I was on mute. No, I was actually going to make comments about the AD command list. Um, Oh, I'm wondering don't, like, don't. how people are using them and the reason why they're uh, wanting to uh, get uh, like to be able to catch an error for them because uh, there's different ways that the scripts can be written with the Active Directory command lips so that you don't have to do that. I think that might be interesting for, for a talk actually. Uh, and actually would, you you should be writing them that way. Like if you don't want to be playing around with error action preference, you should be writing them that way, but you need to then look at stuff being in the handstand, basically upside down and backwards. I mean, one, one, you... here's one use case that I know of uh, that some people might be thinking of is like if you're, if you're doing like get 80 user rbabbit and, and then rbabbit doesn't exist in the directory and then You'll get an error, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you want to wrap that within like a try catch or something like that uh, to be able to capture that if that's the case. A different way to do it is to use filter. So I'll do like get ad user dash filter open curly brace uh, sam account name equals quote unquote our babbit right and curly brace. And then that way, if it doesn't exist, it just returns nothing. And so you you base your logic on how uh, whether or not you uh, get uh, a response. So that's like one one use case that I can think of. So I think in, okay. in some fashion you're right in there, Rick, as far as writing stuff with the understanding of what the expectation is. And I think to you know Jonathan's point and a couple other people's is that AD commandlet don't necessarily like you know work like everybody else. And so they do some funky things and they don't respect all the same rules that everywhere so else is. And so that's really the, the function. And then, but to that, to that same point is you can, you know, as people have shown is that you can write around those problems and you can simply like you just described is, well, not like write around it, but write your, your code. So it gets you different types of errors and those which will, will catch if you're trying to do a try catch. And so it's, it's really in that mode of, understanding what its limitations are and then also you know because it's not completely intuitive and that's really the problem and that's part of my frustration is some of the you know yeah input handling pipeline inputs and stuff like that it doesn't respect like everything else and so it's, it's just one of those things it's, it's unique but it's also unique to ad it's true yeah. yeah i mean there if i wanted to <clears throat> get a stopping error uh you'd have to modify your command for that yeah All right your, at that parameter. So all right, what's next? I want to get off of AD because we all know AD is kind of a dumpster fire. And so we can we can get back to that at the end because we're not even halfway through my slide deck here and we we've only made it through two streams. We haven't even finished this one. So if we could, um, back to Steven's opinions, don't change the color of right error text. Okay. Errors are red. Some people like to get in and play with their consoles. That's fine if you want to do it for your console, but please don't change other people's consoles 
I've seen someone say, yeah, this is great. It's so nice. I, did, I have all my, my error tests go to orange. I'm like, yeah, but orange doesn't say error if, to someone who doesn't know that you tweaked it. Okay. So again, there's another, come at me, bro. Errors are red. We don't like to see the red, but red means something. It's trying to give you information. Now, if you're color, colorblind, red doesn't mean a lot to you. I get that. But for everyone else, this is a standard. Okay. So please don't modify standards. In other words, think of the children. Okay. All right, two streams down. We have a few to go. The warning stream. So warning messages are not failures. That's the point. However, it's important enough to show an interactive user information that they need to know that may cause a problem. And the emphasis, as the color shows, is on may. May cause a problem not necessarily a problem. It can be used to prompt the user to see if they want to continue processing. And we're going to cover that later, but just keep that in your mind is, hey, you can have a warning and then you can ask the user what they want to do, where you might see a warning message. So I do, uh, I do a lot of stuff with the Azure and the AZ module commandlets will give you warnings on upcoming breaking changes. This is a good use of a warning message. For example, new AZ public IP address. And this is something I was doing right before we got started as I was loading one of these things up so we could see it. Where did my window go? Oh, great, it closed. Timed out and closed. Thank you, Azure. Okay, I will spin that back up some other time because I didn't grab a screenshot of it. Drat, ruined my demo. But if you run new AZ public IP address, I'll just tell you what it's doing. It shows warning. We're about to make breaking changes. So if you used to get your IP address using this method, then it's going to change to this method. That's just how Azure does it. What I like to do in warnings is, well, we also have a demo, so I'm gonna get to the demo, okay? So let me continue on. Right, warn, right warning puts the data into the warning stream. Okay, so first thing you need to know that it does is it prepends the message with the stream name, which is cool. So it'll say warning. It doesn't require a change or any settings in order to display the output. Super cool. Oh my God, that's loud. We're going to demo this thing again. Don't worry, I'm not going to Batman signal you for every time we switch to demo. All right, let's look at right warning. Now, this one's short. Run it. Go, go to demo warning, demo warning, right warning. Bad jokes are something you get used to over time. They groan on you. There's the output. Amazing, huh? Notice, put the warning stream at the beginning. I'm not, nice. I'm seeing the slide screen. You are? Yep. I think not you're me. the only one. I, I see the console. The okay. Console. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it works. Um, hope that gets there sorted it on your end. There okay. it is. Yeah, I don't want you to miss my dad joke now. I didn't hear any groans though. I feel you. You let me down on that one, buddy. Are you uh, on mute? I'm mute. I'm on mute. <laughs> All right. So you get used to them over time. They groan on you. Notice that's it. Didn't have to put any parameters on here. I just said right warning and some text. That's what it does. Pretty cool. Okay, back to my slideshow. I'm doing this best practice. So since this one's really short, we'll just jump to write the best practice on the same slide. Use warnings like other commandlets do. If you've seen a commandlet put warning on there, pay attention to how those people are using it. Now we're hoping that they're following some kind of standard and they're doing it in a good job. If they aren't, then send them to me and I'll, I'll try and straighten them out. Okay, or look at my scripts and how I use warnings. Okay, point is, give important information that's not worthy of stopping the execution or storing the output into the error variable and increasing the error count. That's really warning. Let's move on to the verbose string. One of my absolute favorites. Because once I learned this, I started using it everywhere. It gives additional information, but only when requested. It's cool that way. If you use of write verbose does require your code to be an advanced function. 
Okay, so there's two ways to make your code an advanced function. Adding commandlet binding at the top of your command and adding parameter to any of the defined parameters. Okay, I'm gonna show you this so that we kind of get this straightened out when we get to the demo part of it, okay? But before I do that, I wanna take a quick tangent on advanced function common parameters. So what parameters are added to a function when it becomes advanced? So if you haven't done this before, as soon as you make it, put the command that binding on there or you add uh, specific parameters to your parameter variables, then it adds these. We get verbose and debug and error action and warning action and you can read, so I don't have to read to you. But the parentheses ones are all the shortcuts. So if you've ever seen someone do a command and then they do dash OV and then a word after that, they're using the out variable alias. Okay. Now, note, only verbose and debug switches match the right command lines. So, so far we've talked about right output, right error, right warning. Here's right verbose, we're on that one and we're about to go to right debug. So here's verbose and debug. Okay, so we're gonna take note of that because that matters. There's some verbose stream caveats that you need to know about. You can change the verbose preference to output the verbose stream content without the verbose switch or the code being an advanced function. Please don't, okay? Don't do that to your users. It's gonna confuse them. They're gonna get verbose output. You can add the verbose switch to the right verbose command to return the output instead, okay? So why? Why would you put the verbose switch on a right verbose command in your code? So again, please don't. The point is to do right verbose Let's see, I think I have the best practices slide. So I'm gonna save that comment until I get to the best practices slide. Let's talk about actually how you do it. So the point is, is verbose stream via write verbose, you use when you wanna give the status of a script update, okay? For example, when you're looping through a bunch of items, you wanna show which item you're on. But if you're just running your console, you may not want that for regular. So if you're having a, you run a script, let's go back to my 100 servers example, it's running through, everything's fine, but it seems to be taking longer than it should. So you stop your script, you rerun your script with the dash verbose on there, and now it starts telling you, I'm on this server, I'm on this server, I'm on this server. So now you can see what's happening. So you can use write verbose instead of write host for information only updates. Write host is gonna put its content onto the console every time because that's what write host does. Write verbose is only gonna put it on there if you put the verbose switch on there. So you can have either the noisy version or the non-noisy version. That's the nice thing about it. Okay, so here's back to my opinion. When to use write verbose versus write host? Consider your user's experience. So you know, again, don't be abusive to your users. Don't let them think that your code is not working as well. So if a particular task that you're doing is going out and gathering a lot of information, then give them little hints that says, hey, I'm I'm on this step, I'm on this step, okay? I like to use write host for that because it shows up on the console. Now, again, we've already started with the the opinion of Don Jones saying, you know, write host is, is bad, okay? But there, I still think there's times for it. I like to use write verbose more than write host, but there are times for it. Um, based on how long a particular step takes, that I can bullet item of what I was saying before. Okay, let's get to the demo so that we can kind of make sense out of this verbose stream. And it'll be it'll be more clear when you see it. All right, so we'll just start by looking at it first and I'll kind of talk through. So here's my first function. Demo verbose, verbose one with commandlet binding, a blank parameter block, because if you put commandlet binding on there, you must have a parameter block even if it's blank, and then it says write verbose. Number two, kind of does the same thing. It's interesting, but it's the same code. Okay, how I'm gonna execute them down here is different, so we're gonna see that. And then demo verbose three. Notice this one does not have commandlet binding, but it does have a parameter setting above the parameter. Okay, and then write verbose 
the message. All right, so let's run this. Let's get get into here. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. That was F11. I needed F5. Okay, make sure I'm down at the bottom here. Okay. First one is run demo verbose one with the verbose switch. Goes up here and says verbose. Demos are cool. Excellent. Just like I expected it to. Now we'll go to number two. Look what I'm doing here. I'm saying run demo verbose two with the verbose switch and then redirect four into verbose text. Let's see what that does. Same same code as verbose one. Exactly the same. In fact, I probably should have just reused that because I didn't I'll need to have two of them here. Notice nothing showed up on screen in the console. Okay, down here, nothing showed up. But if I do get content on verbose text, I get demos are cool. Also note, this one says verbose because it gave us the stream name, but what actually went into the file was only the content. Okay, let's get to number three. Now this one, a little different in that we actually have a parameter for the message and then it'll write verbose the message. So you can do demo verbose and I put dash verbose on here. And when I run that, it gets to the message and it pops up the, the message. Again, the point that I wanted to show you is that these have the commandlet bindings and that's how they become advanced parameters. This one has a specified parameter setting and this one now acts as an advanced commandlet. If you've never seen that before, it's kind of interesting. So by, by adding the parameter there, even though it's empty, I pick up all the other bells and whistles that an advanced function Brings. That, is, that is correct. So if I do this, if I do down here, since I've loaded this, I do demo verbose three, I'll do three, and I'll do dash, and I'll do control space so we can see them all. And as you can see, I got all the common parameters, even though I didn't put commandment binding on there. Hmm. So that's so, a, that's a little different topic than what you're talking about. But um, what is is there a downside to doing it that way? Because obviously everybody is always taught commandlet binding advanced function. Downside is exactly what you just said. If, if someone said it, if I look at this code and think to yourself, ah, oh, that's not an advanced commandlet or that's not an advanced function. But because of the parameter here, then it acts as an advanced. This is not best practice. I just wanted to show you that it can be done so that if you ever see it in the wild, you can be used by it. Okay. All right. Let's move. Let's move out of there. All right. So, so let's talk about best practices. So use write verbose where you typically use inline comments. That's what I like to do. So normally where I would do pound this block is now doing this. Pound this block is now doing this. I tend to switch those over to write verbose because then when you run the script and you put the verbose switch on there, you can go, I'm at this point of the code. I'm at this point of the code and you can just see it all happen as it goes through your code. OK, now note, this is more art than science, so I'm not going to tell you this is the way to do it. You decide how much information you want to put on the screen. If you need the verbose output, then use it. If you need to give them a hint that something's happening, then maybe you want to do write host so that your user doesn't have to remember to do the verbose switch. Again, art. The cool, I mean, not the cool, cool, the key is to don't annoy your users. So if you find it annoying, your users are going to find it annoying. Okay, so that's where it's art, not science. Don't flood them with useless info, but do give relevant feedback. Okay, those are my best practice rules not really hard and fast rules for verbose stream. Next up, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into this one and then I'm gonna check in and see if we have more questions because I know I'm I'm starting to get kind of quick on these. Debug stream is to give debug information, but only when requested. I've never used this stream. I don't remember ever seeing this stream used. 
So if you have seen this stream used, please go ahead and give us some note in the chat. Now, if you've been in PowerShell a long time, you know why the debug stream exists. It goes all the way back to 2.0, and I couldn't find out if it was in 1.0, but I think it was in 1.0. I just don't know. Okay. Once integrated scripting environments became available, they replaced the need for the debug stream because you can do what I'm basically doing in VS Code. You can put breakpoints in your code. You can do um, the wait debugger, and it'll stop. And you can work your way through it. I just haven't ever seen a need for the debug stream. Doesn't mean that there isn't. I just haven't done it. Okay. Debug stream via write debug, almost identical to the verbose. It's used when you want to send debug information. Very similar to write verbose in functionality. And let's take a look at it. This is going to look very familiar. Okay. It has to be an advanced commandlet. Doesn't work otherwise. Here's your parameter, write debug, console debugging is not cool. You don't want to do console debugging. And then debug two, same thing. Um, I'm not even sure that I need to go through this because it's frankly a, a virtual duplicate of write verbose. First one, you get the debug, well, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it anyway. Just so you can see, the reason I'm gonna do it is because I want you to see the text. Notice how to put debug at the beginning. That's it. There's the main difference. And we're going to blast on through this. So this was me writing the fifth stream into debug.txt and doing the get content on debug text. And now you can see that debug, console debugging is not cool. Okay. So just to offer this input, the only thing that I've ever used debug for is kind of like only for my very verbose. Like you said, it's similar to write verbose. But it's like a secondary write verbose. It's a it's a deeper level write verbose. Is that if I need to write stuff that that only I need to see. But then you know write verbose is for you know, normal users to run when they need to. But verbose for debug is for definitely this is for debug purposes and you don't put normal end user stuff in there. You put like hey this variable was this this variable was that. So that's something definitely you do not put inside of write verbose. Like hey the current version of this is you know that kind of thing. So that's right. what I in the past but that was many years ago i'm just telling you i haven't used it doesn't mean there's not good reasons for it doesn't mean that your use of it is not amazing i've never used it but that's just me okay but let's talk about some best practices for the the debug from the from the writer's standpoint is use vs code or ise you know if you want to get the information from your objects get the information from your objects putting stuff in the debug stream Okay, so you're not polluting your streams, but I don't know whether that's gaining you much or not. I can see where there's uses for it. Again, it's pretty pretty edge case stuff. And seriously, just use just use the IDEs for your debugging. It's just an easier way to get through the information. Speaking of information, let's talk about the information stream. The information stream was added in PowerShell 5 to stop killing puppies. And someone I saw someone posted the actual quote into the chat. So we can go back to that if you want to go look for it. But it's Don Jones saying, every time someone does write host, kill some puppies. All right, so it allows the capturing of informational messages. Because write host, you can't capture it. Nothing you can do, well, I say nothing. You can, you can do um, the journaling where you're capturing everything. But don't don't do it. It's not journaling. It's um, transcript. So you can start transcript and it'll capture it. But that's an ugly message. Don't do that. Okay. Since write host output can't be captured, they invented the information stream. So let's take a look at it. By default, by the way, I find this weird, but it is the way it is. By default, write information doesn't write anything. Okay. That's what. Capture the output using the information variable. Okay, so we're going to look at code that, that will hopefully explain this better than my slide does. You can, if you change the information action to continue, then you see it. Because by default, the information action for write information is silently continued. So even if you do, well, let's actually do one right quick just for, for, the, for the grins. 
for the lulls, if you will. We'll do text again and we'll type that to write out right information. There you go. It does nothing. That's what I was talking about. So if you change the information action to continue, this is in my demo, but I like doing it this way too. Information action continue, and now you get the text. So what was what was the information action before you said it to continue? Okay. Let's uh, let's pull that up. Dollar information preference silently uh, continue. Uh, okay. So by default it does nothing. It just rolls right on by. Now this command right oh, actually this is in my my actual code demo so I want to show you this. Okay. So let's let me press F5 and get this thing rolling. And we're going to go to demo info one. And it says get child item present working directory. Ta da! There's my fox for this demonstration. And then it's going to do write information done with information action continue. And so just put done on screen. Okay. Here's the next thing it's going to do we're going to take demo info one and we're going to put it into results. So here it goes. Notice there's nothing, nothing showed up on screen because I'm putting this in the results variable. And write information just popped on the screen. Now why is that? Because what goes into the results variable is the success stream, not the information stream. So the information stream popped onto the display, but the actual results, when we get to the results here is only the system IO file info object. And then if we look at the results, you can see the files. All right, so I'm going to do this one more time here is we're going to redirect. So we're going to go to do info two. There's the list. There's right information done. Notice how nothing shows up on screen. Okay, now we're going to do demo info two. We're going to redirect six into information text. One more time around the block here, and we'll get the content for information. And it put done in there. Now, now, what happens if we combine those two streams using the stream redirect? So we're going to redirect six into one, and that's going to go into the results. Okay, so one more time through, get child item, that went into results, write information done, continue, that went into results. And so now when we look at the objects for results, we get two back. We get system IO file info and an information record. So then when we look at that, they're now combined together. Now this is where I'm going to tell you or remind you that it's not always a good idea to return multiple types of objects in your code because now you're going to have to handle two different types of objects. Okay. Because the, again, the point of the streams is to separate out your objects. And in your success stream, you want to be very cognizant of what kinds of objects you're putting into your success stream so that you can then send those down the pipeline into another function that you've written and then act on that particular object. Okay, and that's the joy of pipelining is that you want to keep your objects very clean. Any questions on that demo? Okay, good. Let's talk about the best practices and then we're getting close to the finish here. So thank you for all hanging in there. Use right host for colors. That is my favorite thing about right host is it has the foreground color and the background color. So if you're trying to give information to your users and you're trying to use visual distinctions, use right host. Right information will not give you any colors. But right information can be used to capture the data, which is great because we want to capture the data for some of our information streams. Okay, so you got to decide which which am I going to do? Am I going to capture the data or am I going to go for the colors? That was really all the best practices I had for it because I don't spend a lot of my time doing the right information. Okay, I I am either doing verbose or right host depending upon what it is I'm trying to do, and Wait, the pro progress stream? The what now? 
Okay, I told you there was six streams. There's another one. This is the mystery stream. It's a bonus stream. Did you even know there was a progress stream? It's used to communicate progress via the custom defined progress bar. It is also an unnumbered stream. In other words, you can't redirect the output. Okay, that's interesting. Guess what? It has write progress. So you got six streams plus the bonus. Okay. When used when building of data may take a while. So that's what I use the write progress for is to give information when something's going to take a while. And consider the user experience. Okay, we're back to it's more art than science. Okay, so let's look at a quick demo. And by the way, this demo is 100% theft. I stole it completely out of the uh, examples for right progress. So what it's going to do is says for each I and one to three, put a right progress bar up here and then go to J for one to five and do the right progress bar for that. And then for K, do one to 10 and then do right progress for that. Except at the end of this one, good grief. I just realized that they did a semicolon and a start sleep on this line. And who wrote this help? Whatever. So start sleep, 100 milliseconds. And then I'm going to output this stuff to screen. OK. So let's run this. I don't have this broken up into individual functions. But I want you to see what this does on screen. And I hope it comes across on the sharing. Look at that thing hop around. OK. So it's just building the dots and the different arrays here for group one, group two, group three, and you kind of see what it's doing, okay? But because I've got right host, right after right progress, it's having to write the progress and then write to the host every time. It's actually better if you do it like this, where I'm gonna define output, I'm going to have the same code, same everything, and then over here on the output, I'm going to just add this in. And then at the end, I'm going to output the output. As you can see, when this one runs, yes, I know I changed the millisecond, but you'll see. Notice what this one's doing. Went by too fast. Let me slow that down a little bit. I just realized that that was a bad experience. Let me try that again. Okay, so here it goes going through these iterations and the sub steps. And then here's step, the main step. Okay, now it's not redrawing everything, it's just redrawing the progress. So this gives you a bit, if you've ever done a right progress and you've, you've seen it hopping up and down trying to figure out why, it's because you're outputting information in the console at the same time. Okay, just a little tip there. I use right progress a lot especially for long running things, it's just helpful to your users to see it. Right progress doesn't have something where you have a switch where you have to turn it on. It just is part of your code. So when you put it in there, just be aware that it's going to show up. Okay. It's not like right verbose or right information. It's not like you can turn it on and turn it off. And yes, Jonathan, I cheated because I was in a hurry. So uh, best practice, don't do this. This is slow. I, I just got busted. Sorry. All right. Let me get that off screen right quick. I'm tired. Of, I'm going to get more flaming from that. All right. Let's finish oh, this up. Man. Let's wind it down. <laughs> yes, I know. I should have used a, a proper app driver. Okay. Call to action. Call to action. Use the action parameters to change how a commandment responds. So like error action. I showed you that one. The default value for error action is continue. So change it if you need your try block to work. Okay, write the error to the error stream and keep processing. That's what it does by default. Information action by default is silently continued. So you're not going to see anything. It's kind of weird, but hey, that's how it works. So just be aware of that. So if you really want to see the information action, you better change that from silently continued. And you can do an error action in line. So some do show to screen and some don't. Just pick which one you want to do. Write nothing, save nothing. Okay. 
So if you change the value to continue, you'll actually see your write information messages. Now, this is the one I threw way back, but you probably don't remember because I've talked so much about it. But in warning action, the default value is continue. So it always writes it when you see it. What's cool is you can change this value to inquire, and it'll actually pause the processing and prompt to see whether the user wants to continue. So you may get to a warning and go, hey, this is a warning. I don't know what you want to do. Do you want to keep going? Because this may break things farther down the script. So what do you want to do? And so the user can then decide how they want to do it. Again, this is the warning action. So you decide, hey, I want to actually prompt with the user. And if you want more details about the common parameters, here's the link to the document to get that done. All right. So which preference do you prefer? Do you prefer get variable preference? Let's see what those are. Just we want to see them. So I'm going to do get variable star preference. And here are your preferences. So these are the defaults. Confirm is set to high. Debug is silent. And by the way, this is where you find all this information. So you can see what they are. You can change them. OK, you can just say, hey, I want my uh, warning preference equal. What did I say I want to do? Inquire. I probably should put text around that so it'll actually work. Now I'll run it again and look at my preferences. And now it's inquire. So now when I do write warning, doing this all in the console, but it would work the same in your script. And I say, look out. Now it's prompting me. Hey, do you want to keep going? You've had this warning to look at. Okay. That's what it's doing now. Now I've set that on my console, so it's going to last until I keep until I restart my console or set it back. So again, that's what I'm saying. Don't be abusive to your users by changing the defaults. Put it in your function. In this case, yes, I want to continue. There we go. I told you once, I've told you a bunch of times, and now I've told you on a bullet. Don't change the defaults. Seriously, just don't. Use the scoping of PowerShell to your advantage. I'm also going to take this moment to say, please write functions rather than scripts. Even if your function is all of your code up at the top for your function, and then at the bottom, at the very end, is you calling the function that you just wrote. To me, that's a better experience for your users, and it'll give you better, more controllable code than if you write it as a script where it's now polluting your console with variables and other settings. Okay, again, Steven's opinion, Steven's presentation. Uh, change the preference in the function if you must, and that's why it works well that way. This will not pollute the host scope. Okay. Points to write down. Be thoughtful about your output. You want to pay attention to what you're giving the user so that they're happy with the product that they're working with also known as the stream of consciousness. Okay, don't cross the streams. Someone tried to steal my joke in the chat. I'm glad it doesn't go into the presentation because it's my joke. It's not your joke, don't steal my jokes. Unless your code is fighting Gozer the Gozerian. If your code is fighting Gozer the Gozerian, then you're allowed to cross the streams, okay? <laughs> Other than that, don't do that. <laughs> Give a hoot, don't pollute. Woodsy Al thanks you for not polluting your console with bad data and all that. Remove wrinkles in your code with stream. You want your output to look its best. Oh my God. Come on, these, are getting, these are getting better. Oh, they get better. Uh, that's do these debatable. Jokes, do these jokes make you want to stream out loud? Uh. Maybe you should redirect your ire. Just saying. So we, he, he deliberately lulls us into a sense, false sense of security by oh, not throwing goodness. a lot of dad jokes and then hits us with a last slide. It's not the last slide, but it's close. Don't play games with your output. Be stream powered. That was really bad. I didn't like that. But wait, There's more. we have a logo. Oh, no. For PowerShell stream. Is that an official logo? 
Well, it's official to me. It's in my slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the time at which I've got my slide for questions. Um, I, for those of you that need to ditch out of here, Aaron, I want you to stay in touch with me. I'm on Twitter at Stephen Judd. I'm on Discord at Judd Missile number 7741. Does anyone know what those numbers mean? I have no idea. I'm on the PowerShell Bridge channel. You can find me on Discord there. Um, there's my LinkedIn if you want to follow me professionally. My nice professional share. approach does not have a ton of dad jokes, but it does have links to my other presentations, which does have a lot of dad jokes. Someone might have noticed my ICQ number. I'm not actually on ICQ. Please don't try to hit me there. But can you see my low number? Woo. Nice. My blog, any of you know CSS, you go look at my blog and you'll cry and it needs help. But you know, if, I'm not a CSS person. GitHub, I will be putting the code and the presentation up on GitHub. So uh, make it available. I'm sorry I didn't have this done and already in the slide. Okay. Oh, I realized I just put SJ URL defense because that was from my previous presentation. And that's it. You're welcome. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Awesome. That was a, very that good. Was a, that was a very deep dive. Excellent. All right, so we'll 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 wrap it up here with this uh, finishing up on the various streams and the right commandlets and how to use them correctly. Uh, we'll take a five minute final ask here for anybody who might want to bring up some topics. Otherwise, we'll wrap this up while we're waiting for some questions to come in. I'll remind people who are watching the Research Triangle Palisher User Group meets meets twice a month. The first and third Wednesday of the month. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find us at rtpsug.com or on Meetup. You can find us there. We would love to have you at our next meeting. Please find us. We would love to, for you to join us. Stephen, thank you for taking the time to explain this stuff to us tonight. You definitely made my life better. I understand more things about the various right commandments in the streams. I may cross the streams. I may not. I'm not sure. Hey, you know what? Every once in a while, you got to cross some streams. All right. So with that, we're going to say good night. Thanks for joining us tonight, everyone.